Hello and welcome. I'm Mr. Quack, and today I'm here with Locke from Giants and Lucky Juice. Today we're going to continue our discussion on the Battle of Zara Law, picking up from where we were, but also mentioning things that we would like to talk about last week. How are you, Locke? I'm good. How are you, Etch? I'm good. It's hot. I'm good. So, do you mind if I start off with a question in this term? This term? Yeah, sure. You mentioned her car in relation to the blood moon last week. Just curious if you were willing to elaborate on that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you're sort of getting at, as in sort of like what you'd like me to talk about. Ah, in general, well, I guess the initial question is, do you think the blood moon is a blood moon? Uh, not quite. I think it's, uh, I think it's some form of like synthetic-y uh, construct, I guess you'd say, uh, only because it hangs out in the necropolis, but like if you sort of leave the necropolis area, um, it very much disappears. I mean, when you're in the necropolis area in Nazmir, you, you are actually like, either in or almost in uh, the Shadow Realm or the other side. Um, and so when one Sunday turns up in the battle for Dazzler or, God, I cannot say that properly. Do you want to uh, just call it the Battle of Dazzler and leave it that? <laughs> battle for Dazzler, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Um, so yeah, so when you turn up in the raid and you go start going through the raid, Bwan moves the the blood moon from his necropolis to um Dazzle Law and uh it sort of like plunges that into like the same sort of environment as like his necropolis in Nazmir. So it would I would assume anyway that wherever that blood moon is is where like those types of like uh outer world sort of environments uh would also be so like the blood moon directly affects uh where you are in the realms of the plains if that makes any sense oh, it makes perfect sense for me the well the blood moon all the conversations we've had also those conversations with skinny we've had um my only impression it's not a blood moon the reason why is i've spent way too much time in the spires of iraq also been through TOT a few many, few too many times. And well, what that moon kind of reminds me of in one aspect is an animus orb, like a really, really big one, except it's not drippy with blood. Like that's the, that's the first thing, right? The other thing it reminds me of is um what was it? What's his name? I see, um Wind Serpent. Very, very, very similar to a card that appears on Draenor. And you see the um Sethic resurrecting him. It looks very the blood the the blood moon looks very similar to the quote unquote egg they were hatching this wind serpent out of. So I guess the general question is, would you be willing to say that that moon is not a moon per se, but just a really really big egg? And you know the occupant inside being her car. Ah. Uh. I guess that is a possibility. Uh, we don't really know what's happened to her car since, like, we all assumed that he would be here. Like, we had Gahoon be introduced as a blood god. And, I mean, I've always thought that Zul was working for her car since I saw him in the Zul-Gurub patch when he throws the... Um, Thing into the bonfire and Hakar rises up out of it. Um, so, you know, it's a bit strange that we've gotten this far. We've had blood trolls and and whatnot, and there's like no Hakar. So it could very well be Hakar. Okay, because there are a few interesting things that you mentioned last week and some other things we mentioned that kind of just stood out for me, like um. 
for example, you mentioned the wind serpents. I know you pointed those out to me, but on some he summons wind serpents with the bowmen. And what I find is that's rather unprecedented considering when you look at the lower and the things Bonsamdi have been able Bonsamdi has been able to basically resurrect, it all seems very um compartmentalized to said lower. So for example, um Gold looks after Raptor Raptors uh uh geez I'm forgetting the lower's names. But yeah, Bonsambi looks after the troll dead and just you know, the list goes on. It's very specific, so I just find it rather odd that he's able to summon wind serpents. And on top of that, you mentioned that the gauntlet between um Opulence and Grom, or at least that's for the alliance. Yeah, the gauntlet between Opulence and Grom might have been on the Horde side. On well, the Alliance side I think you're referencing that one. You mentioned that it was similar to um the Sunken Temple. Yes, the the death gauntlet for the alliance um, going to so from Grong to uh, opulence uh, reminds me of Sunken Temple. Yes, um, because you have a whole bunch of dead trolls uh, in a close confined area. I mean, back in the old days uh, in Sunken Temple, you used to have, like run through a whole bunch of areas in Sunken Temple down below. And it was basically a death run because they were all elites. They were all like undead trolls and it was crammed full of them. And, um, well, we know that in Sunken Temple there's a, a boss, a specific boss called the Avatar of Akar, and he's a, a bone wind serpent. And it just it just reminded me of that because um, I, I, I hated having to go to Sunken Temple, not only because it, the, the dungeon itself took ages and if you didn't have a good guide you were stuck down there forever or it felt like forever um you only ever got one attempt at the avatar of a car as well like someone needed the egg to summon him in um and yeah it was just like a, a real trial of a dungeon not only did you have to run through all the undead trolls to begin with to get in there but it was just labyrinthine and yeah it was just a, a terrible terrible time getting into the place but um one thing i did when you were talking about Buon Samdi and the other lower like with their respective sort of like um animals and whatnot respective death in general yeah like um just like rosan with these devil saws gonk with the raptors paku with the pterosaurs etc etc um one thing that did remind me of is down in Zuldazar, near where Nessingwari's camp is, there's a bunch of wind serpents down there, and they're labelled as invasive species. Oh. Yeah, um, and they're, like, breeding really quickly, and they attack, um, like, all the other, like, animals down there, and they're driving them all out um, of the area. Um, you even have like a world quest with a strange egg or something to that effect in the area, which I always thought was a nod to the alien egg quest, which funnily enough is also a red, uh, wind serpent by the name of Arakara, um, in the thousand needles in vanilla, you used to get an alien egg quest and you used to have to go and like do stuff with that to summon it. And later on, Arikara, Ari the red wind serpent, is uh, later out to found, found out to be Magratha Grim Totem's uh, familiar. So, yeah, there's like the big links with, like, you know, wind serpents there. I feel like I've gone off on the tangent, though. I'm very sorry. No, nah, no problem. Going off on tangents, half the fun of speculating and discussing this type of stuff. I'm just thinking about it, and this is going off the raid. For a bit, because we're going to be looking kind of at old deal if I'm about to mention. But um, thinking about the current like sunken temple dungeon area, right, and how you kind of walk in, it's a massive open area, and then you kind of have chambers to the left, right, and straight ahead. Reminds me a lot of old deal actually, except on a sort of much smaller scale, and even like the um 
way it's designed, as in like the um, shape of the place. That's a lot of old deer, especially, and when you consider that the sunken temple is the sunken temple, it's kind of interesting that well, well the sunken temple became that way it did the way it did uh, because of um, the green dragons. You know how I mentioned we mentioned last week, or you mentioned last week, how water might be a relation to purification in general. Possible that the green dragon sunk the sunken temple for that very reason, as in to hopefully keep everything contained, maybe purified. Mm, potentially. I mean, they also kind of trap themselves down there too, and that's how come like a cars faithful were able to like trap Aranicus into the dream because they were like taking his blood and giving it to Hakar and corrupting, like, taking his blood, giving it to Hakar, Hakar was corrupting his blood, and then it was getting injected back into them to corrupt them. The, the green dragons turned into a blood factory for um, Hakar, very similar to Primordius, uh, with the flesh shaping and stuff that was going on there with uh, Throne of Thunder. But it was for Hakar. <laughs> so, yeah. Not a good fate. Fate at all. Do you think they um ended up well in that regard? Was that a selfless sacrifice, or do you think they actually just got stuck after they were trying to deal with the car? Because this is interesting as well that a car's blood does induce a nightmare, right? Yes, it does induce the nightmare. Uh, it turned Aranicus from the consort of uh, Yesera into uh, an, the nightmare um, dragon. And then it took Alun and Taranda and a bunch of heroes and the Sonoran Circle, uh, quite a big effort during the Scepter of the Shifting Sands uh, quest line for the Green Dragon Shard um, to cleanse him in uh, Lake El Elunara in um, Moon Glade. So, yeah, again, there you go. Big chunk of water purifying. Hmm. Kind of interesting considering that's also the Rift of Alm is. Or at least, you know, the Rift of Alm is in Moonblade and. Huh. Yeah, and also where Omen sleeps at the bottom of the lake and he comes up once a year. Wow, that's an interesting, um. Interesting coincidence, I guess. Not that coincidence that I ever get along. Um. Thinking about it as well, in regards to that car, and we're going back to Old Deer again. Sorry if you're after that Battle of the Zara War, or, but with Old Deer, um, Vectus, there's no relative explanation as to why Hakar's blood is in Old Deer, right? Not that I know of. Hmm. Well,. Pitch this, I'll pitch this here, that is here then. What if Hakar was an inmate in Old Deer, similar to the trash law, except, well, except, you know, he survived, but he was experimented on some form or fashion? Yeah, we've had this discussion before where I've said that it, it would, I, I could get behind if he was actually a, a constructed lower um that they sort of like did a whole bunch of uh research and stuff on because he's missing his heart he's got a void crystal as his heart but where his chest is cut open uh it's always reminded me of open heart surgery so like they've broken open his chest everything's sort of exposed in there like that's what you would do um or well, that's what used to happen in old open heart surgery is they would go in break up break open the ribs pop open the ribs with um like uh stanchions or i can't i can't i can't remember the actual term for the equipment used for keeping the ribs open mm -hmm. um but then they would do their stuff in there and then they would close up the ribs hold them together brace them up so that you know they would grow back together and you know yeah Heart was fixed. That's like how they used to put in old pacemakers and uh, fix your heart up and all that sort of stuff. Nowadays, they do it through keyhole surgery, and there's no real need 
to uh, break open your ribs. But uh, yeah, in the old days, they used to do it like that. And that's what Hakar kind of reminds me of. That he's always sort of reminded me of. Hmm. Well, when we consider what Aldea was used for in general, it makes sense, especially considering the whole point was old god experimentation. Not that Hakar's an old god, but considering he's a lower and they were obviously experimenting on lower. Could have used him as some type of subject to see what would happen. A what if scenario. Well, yeah, like Mother specifically says that they were um, experimenting on Lola as like a means to find out um, about old god corruption. So it sort of said to me that maybe the Lola were um, corrupted at some point by the old gods. Um, and then they were using them as a means to sort of like work out how to backwards change that because, you know, that there was quite a lot of lower and they were like the lesser of two evils when it came to old god um, corruption and whatnot to experiment with. So I have mentioned this to you before, like this topic before, but I guess I'll just ask a question again just in case I haven't mentioned this part. When it comes to Kara, he's an odd wind serpent, right? That's just a given, as in he has those two mandibles in comparison not mandibles but like insectoid type arms basically in comparison to normal wind serpents i was just thinking we've got sick balls in there we've got vectus those two bosses just kind of how i put it it kind of just lines up kind of well the idea that um well whatever experimentation happened to the car kind of well, kind of ended up with a fusion, which ended up creating the lower blood in general. Yeah, it, it, it is possible that that's how he got his sort of connection to the nightmare too, is through that old god manipulation. I guess the final question I'll ask in regards to um, this topic of the blood moon in general is, um, on Samdi's boss, right, as in if this is actually moon is actually an egg and it's got a car in it. Do you think Bonsamdi's boss is a car or do you think it's someone else? Oh gee, what a loaded question. Um, I don't really know who Bonsamdi's boss is. I mean, if we're talking Haish and Lower where Baron Samidi is there, um, you would think that um, Maman Brigitte would feature. I mean, that's his wife, um, and without her, he can't do anything real um, in terms of, like, resurrection, as far as I'm aware. I could be completely wrong, so don't quote me on that. But um, uh, as far as Hakar being the boss of Juan Samdi, I don't know because I know Hakar was considered eternal. Like, he can't be killed. So he's very similar to Alun. Um in fact, uh, if I would hazard a guess to say anything, that Hakar is like the equivalent of a loon, but for the Shadowlands. Um, so potentially Hakar could be one somebody's boss. I mean. Oh, I got two things for that, right? Like the, the first question is, um, oh, don't lose the question now. What was it? No, the first question's gone completely. Go on to the second question. It's more like a statement theory, right? So, once again, I have a really... For those who don't know, I generally have a really bad um, habit of looking into Arakoban lore because I think it's really, really, really important. And um, one of the things that turns up in Arakoan lore is the three gods of the Arakoa. And one is Seed. One is Rukma and one is Anzu. And basically, C is a wind serpent, match almost perfectly matches Hakar in every way, shape, or form, down to the corrupted blood that will either induce nightmares or just turn people crazy. Seeds cripples the Arako as well, but you've got C, right? You've got Rukma, which is described as basically being a white fire phoenix, right? And you mentioned the idea that Hakar, in some regards, may be similar to a loon. Well, three gods of the Arakoa, they're all on par with each other. 
just making me think that, okay, if that's the case, Rookbar could be the equivalent of a loom, you know, on Draenor. It kind of fits the idea, you know, of um, arcane magic as well. It's the idea that you have a, oh yeah, a white fire phoenix, which as we kind of discussed last week, or mentioned last week, kind of relates to the arcane in general, but this time it's white fire. And Loon's magic is always related to the white in general. And you got Anzu, which in regards to his lore, he's, well, his connection to the um, undead is almost a given, or at least the Shadowlands is a given. Because after everything that occurs in regards to C, Brookmar, and Anzu, he runs off to the Shadowlands. And, hmm, just thinking if Lonsamdi isn't equivalent It'd be interesting if his boss was the, I guess, Anzu equivalent for Azeroth. I guess the really interesting about all this is that it's like if these three gods are, well, equated to Azerothian gods, that's like Lu and Akara and this other mysterious figure, then um, it's got a really interesting story going because Anzu and Rukmar absolutely despise seeds. And so the question kind of becomes, why would one of Anzu's followers, specifically one Samdi or just Anzu himself, have Picard's, um, well, egg, you know, have the blood moon in general? And this actually just reminded me of the first question. Am I going on or is it like a sleazy to follow? No, I'm, I'm listening. I've got a few things that... Um, especially when it comes to Anzu and uh, the nightmare that appears in the old Druid epic platform quest on BC. Like, he's the one that you have to go and stop, Anzu is, because he's trying to get through to the Ember Dream to corrupt it and turn it into nightmare. Ah, okay. Just, I will just while I remember this first question, go with that, then we'll definitely go on to that because that's got to have some interesting more to it. Um, you mentioned Baron Samedi as in the idea that Onsami is the equivalent of Baron Samedi and his wife, Mama Bridget. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the conversation we had about this earlier, the idea is that, uh, Mama Bridget is actually, or at least you can kind of trace the origins of said figure back to Ireland because she was a missionary. Saint. Yes, she she was a she was Saint Bridget in um, Ireland, and for those who who know the history of it, they they would know that um, tales of Saint Bridget's love and care and um, like healing and and life uh, aspects came over with the Irish. Um, and how Mam and Bridget sort of gets in mixed in with all the lower is that um, it wasn't just unfortunate. Unfortunately, it wasn't just uh, uh, how how do I say this? Like back in New Orleans, there there were uh, basically uh, prostitute houses and, and and that sort of stuff, and uh, a lot of women of colour and Irish were sort of subjugated in these houses and how Mam and Bridget sort of uh, integrated her way into the, the lore is via that. Um, as far as I, I am aware, uh, I'm probably butchering this terribly. I am not really uh, fully up to speed with uh, the lower uh, specifically Haitian lower, but um, from researching it and uh, being taught about about them as sparse as it was, um, yes, she she was a, a, a Irish saint, um, Catholic saint, and she was brought to America with the Irish. Uh, Mamma Bridget was then like uh, Saint Bridget was then turned into Mamma Bridget, and then she was married to. Uh, Baron Samedi and Mam Bridget is a 
grave lower. She is part of the grave family, being the wife of uh, Baron Smeedy. But from what I remember uh, being taught about her is that if you wanted someone to be resurrected, um, you partition, you, you you sort of like patronize the the uh, um, the the lower uh, the, the grave lower, and you ask them if you can have them back. And it's up to uh, Baron Smeedy and his wife, Maman Bruget, to to bring them back. So if you if you want someone to stay healthy, you pray, you give your praise to um, Maman Bruget. If they're very very sick and you want to stay them off, you ask Baron Smeedy not to take them. But if you want, if they're like dead um, or dying really badly and you want them to be resurrected, you ask both of them because Baron Smeedy can't do it without Maman Bruget. Which leads me to Talanji. Um, ever since I ever, ever since I saw the Bloodgate, sorry, I'm just gonna go um, the Bloodgate stuff uh, and the, the deal with Rastakhan and uh, between Bourne and uh, Rastakhan. Uh, I've always thought that maybe Mama and Bruget was supposed to be Talanji, and that uh, Old Bourne is not exactly after an empire completely because he knows empires come and go. Um, but he's after Talanji because when you do spoilers, <laughs> when you do the uh, Vol'jin spirit uh, line, Ebonhorn and Master Gadron and everyone else says that, you know, this would be so much easier if Talanji did it because, you know, she's got so much power. She's such raw spirit power. She's so powerful. She should be doing this. And she's able just to call like on Vol'jin. She's like, hey, Vol'jin, come here, please. And he's just like, yeah, okay, I can hear. Um, and even Bon Sambi himself, um, he acts differently around Talanji in comparison to everyone else. Um, so there's also that. Sorry to go on a tangent. <laughs> no, don't don't apologize because that was that was basically what I was going to ask because. The entire impression I got from the story in regards to Madame Bridget was the idea that it's like, could that be Talanji? And basically go with this idea that Bon Sambi's, oh yeah, after a wife, basically, or at least some of the power to fully resurrect the dead in some way, shape, or form, or just after some extreme power, right? And he needs Talanji for that. The question I'd ask is if Zal is still in regards to worship, like he's still worshipping Hakar, even though he did all this crazy stuff with Kahoot, and this is something underlining with Hakar still relevant, right? Is it possible that, because we know Ron Sambi loves deals, that Hakar made, sorry, not Hakar, Zal made a deal with Ron Sambi, and the deal is pretty simple. You raise Hakar with the Blood Moon, I'll do my crazy stuff with um, Old Deer, and maybe you just don't interfere. And because it's pretty obvious, Bonsambi does not like the blood trolls at all. But anyway, so the deal is Bonsambi races a car, and in return, Zal majoritively gives Bonsambi um, Talanji. Because we still don't actually have any idea why Zal and Bonsambi were in a prison together in like Alliance in Stormwind. As we don't know why they were together in the first place, and it's pretty obvious they haven't really gotten along ever. So, you think that might be a possibility? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, backdoor deals like that, probably we won't know about for a very long time, if ever, sort of thing. Um, okay. Blizzard is pretty cryptic when it comes to that sort of stuff. I mean, it is possible. It is like a, a likely turn of events because both people do like making deals, but it, it would be too early for me to say that that's where it's headed. Okay. Because I mean, really, the idea is the idea behind this is that if there was a deal made in that regards, when somebody kind of, well, tweaked it, or didn't tweak it, but he kind of got out of it with Zell's death, as in the idea is like he was contractually obliged to do. You know, race a car for me, 
hence the blood moon, and also with the power to you know raise wind certain spirits and whatnot. But because they'll died, one somebody might be mightn't be contractually obligated to actually awaken a car anymore. And then again, if we go with the Man of Jet idea, it's possible that he just needs Solange to fulfill the contract to begin with. And then I help you guess your power to resurrect and you will resurrect a car when you gain this power. At least that might have been the deal. Maybe. But yeah, we've probably gone on a bit too much of a tangent in regards to this um Blood Moon. Oh, got one other thing. I actually want to mention in regards to this Blood Moon. Like one other thing. And that is the um Zandalari troll druid form. Specifically the Moonkin form, right? And this is kind of one of the things that really really implies to me that the Arakoa and the um, Trolls and possibly the Elves in general have very close ties. Um, and it's that the Moonkin form for the Trolls looks like an Arakoa, as in like it's the same model. And okay, it might be just a reuse of assets, but considering this is a form people are going to be looking at for quite a while, I think it has some relative importance. And if there is importance there, then the three gods, the Arakoa, and the trolls, and the Arakoa themselves, they might all share a very, very similar history, as in, like, identical or certain events kind of just line up perfectly. I mean, like, just for example, um, the Curse of Sea that cripples Arakoa takes away their wings, right? Yeah. It matches um, trolls in regards to the way they kind of are. Because you know how trolls are hunched over, really tall, but kind of diminutive in general, right? Matches the other. Well, the dark spear and the jungle trolls are. The Zandalari aren't, but... Uh, Not a good point. Most trolls, I guess. I mean, Zandalari, I'm assuming, are the OG trolls, or at least a part of that group. But when we can see that, I guess, Blood Trolls, Amani, Drakari, Dark Spear, this goes on, most are hunched. And the idea is that if this hunch might actually relate to something similar to the Curse of Sea, except the equivalent would be, I guess, the quote-unquote Curse of Hakar. And the implication here would also be that the Trolls in just a long time ago most likely or birds in some way, shape, or form, or kind of similar to the Arakoa and had wings, but over a very, very long time just kind of lost them in general. But yeah, this is probably a topic for another video, so I'll stop going on about this. So, uh, let's go back to the raid. <laughs> yeah. um, where did we leave off? I think we left off... At King Rasta Khan, like we we didn't really talk about Bonsamdi and King Rasta Khan all that much, yeah. Yeah, we're up to Bonsamdi and King Rasta Khan. So, what do you find interesting about Bonsamdi and Rasta Khan? That the death gates and the balls are very difficult to dodge. You found them difficult to dodge. Yes, because I have to go downstairs. Oh, wait, you're wait. You play Shaman right in the resto, right? Correct. What? Do you have a druid in your group, by chance? Maybe a monk? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, our, our healing setup is two priests, a monk, and myself. Ah, okay. So Spirit Walker's Grace comes in kind of handy if the kind of timing for the whole thing works out well. Otherwise, I'm sure it just gets hectic very fast. Yeah, and I throw a lot of totems. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, the actual boss, the bosses, uh, I think it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you you have the retainers that you beat up fast. So Rastakhan's retainers, and then Rastakhan goes, oh, Buon Samdi! You're going to have to help us because, uh, like, your people have been beaten up. 
And if you don't help us, like, you know, you're not going to be having an empire. And then one somebody sort of sasses back and says that, you know, he's not going to like let Rastakhan lose like his throne, stop being a little crybaby. And then he floats down after we're all like terrified. Um, so that's all pretty straightforward. Um, so then you're still fighting uh, Rastakhan. I've heard people say that Rasta Khan is a shaman, but he's actually a witch doctor. At least that's what he was in the RPG. And I think that that's why he sends out the, the plague frogs and um, and has like the, the zombie dust totem and, and whatnot, like where you can mind control people and stuff like that is because he's actually meant to be a witch doctor. I, I would completely agree with that as in you played Diablo. Uh, I have been known to dabble in Diablo, yes. Yeah, um, most of his abilities just scream Diablo. Yeah, it was like, okay, okay, he's a witch doctor, it's a given. Though I guess it would be interesting to see if they kind of incorporate witch doctor abilities into shamanism over time. That said, they would have to kind of give a relatively good explanation as to why shamans can raise the dead. But then again, that might have something to do with the element of decay. But anyway, you were saying? Well, we kind of can resurrect the dead because we can like bring them back. With like you know, like mass res and stuff, but sorry. So then you beat him up a bit more, and then one somebody like sucks you down into the spirit realm where it's all black and white, lots of balls, lots of death gates, lots of stacking debuffs, lots of people running around crazy or trying to kill him. Uh, very hectic downstairs. I mean, I've healed up the top as well. It's not as hectic. Yeah, just sort of beat up Rastakam while dodging balls and you know. It's, really cruisy in comparison to uh, downstairs. You sound disappointed. Oh, I mean, if I if I had a, a choice, I'd stay up the top because I'm lazy. But, uh, <laughs> but downstairs, downstairs is not too bad. I mean, I've soloed healed both of them in normal before as well, and, and it's not been too bad. But, um, yeah. As far as like the, the boss mechanics and stuff like that, I mean, there's nothing really that's there that sh sort of like speaks of the lore apart from like Rustic Khan's abilities and being a witch doctor. Um, you've got the dynamic between Rustic Khan sort of being very desperate to hang on to his um, empire uh, and one somebody being like he's sort of offsider and you see like the sort of deal being made there with um, when Vaughn fully infuses Rastakhan. Rastakhan then decides that, you know, it's not power that you should really take, that it's a curse and that he kind of like regrets uh, the deal that he made when he was dying himself. Um, well, actually, it makes me wonder about something in regards to, I guess, Vaughn Sambi's character, right? Because, okay. In regards to mortals dealing with that power, it's really, really bad. As in, you know, horrible. It's curses. Um, that's kind of puts it. It makes me wonder in regards to Bonsampi if he's always okay. Assume that he's always been a lower, but even just being a lower for all that time, you think that power had would have some type of effect on your character in general, not be, and he wouldn't be as. Well, I'd expect him to be a lot darker. To be honest, if the power is that bad, or if it's just a matter of this power in general is just purely a curse. Um. Well, we we do see him change. Um, physically, like he does actually get darker. He gets like a lot of lightning, sort of like veiny sort of effects on him and and whatnot. What I found interesting is doing the next little sort of bit in the story for Talanji's like ascension to queen. Um, you have people yelling out that, um, you know, Rasta Khan's family is cursed, like we don't want her as a queen, she follows Born Sumdi. And that is all orchestrated spoilers again by um, a priestess of Shadra, the, the spider lower. And um, she gets the other life lowers, so um, all the other priests, that aren't born somebody to sort of revolt against and cause a ruckus on um, Talanji's uh, 
coronation, if you will. And um, I just found it interesting because we, we know from playing the, the very starting sort of story that Shadra uh, is sort of usurping uh, Johnny's lower of um, secrets. Secrets, yeah. She she's the the silk dancer is like the mistress mistress of um, spies and secrets and and stuff like that. So it makes me wonder what that like what Shadra sort of said to or what she showed this particular follower of hers. Because we, we know lowers can't really die. They come back because her car's come back so many times now. It's not funny. Um, but so is Shadra, for example. We've killed her in the hinterlands. Uh, we've killed her in her us- um, usurped form in uh, the original ZG. Uh, we kill her again in her usurped form with, like, Yasma. So, I mean, it's very, very possible that Shadra's going to come back unless it's a three strikes and then you're out kind of deal, which I very doubt that, very much doubt that that's the case, although that would be pretty funny. Well, you died three times as a lower. I don't think you should come back. Obviously, you're really bad at being a lower if you've died three times already. Like, I think someone else should be given the the, the title of lower. But, yeah, I don't think that's the case. Like, so we, we know that Shadra's there still calling some shots and so this happens it makes me wonder what that spider lady knows in terms of one somebody's uh deals and what this sort of means for the the empire being connected to born as a um prime lower hmm well just thinking you say all the lowers of life like which lowers specifically i haven't i Part. I still need to do a lot of rep grinding to get there, but um, oh, yeah. What um lowers do they end up? Will end up revolting in general? Does she get to revolt? Um, well, we definitely see some of the prelates doing it. So the the old prelates of Razan, um, uh, Rala or Raka, I can't remember her name, but I, I think it's like High Prelate Rala is shocked to find out that like some of her own prelates are, are causing a ruckus on um. Talanji's uh, coronation day. I saw Rappari druids doing it, so like Gonk's followers, Paku's followers. Um, I beat up a priest of um, Zanza. Who? Zanza, the uh, lower, the Zandalari uh, troll lower from ZG. Uh, he helped. Uh, I th- I'm almost certainly a certain it's Zanza that, um, or maybe I'm saying his name wrong. Maybe it's Zanzil. But anyway. Oh, he- Zanzil, right, yeah. <laughs> An alchemy guy throws potions. Not the undead witch doctor dude. No? Uh, so it must, it must have to be Zanza. Okay. But, um,. Zanza, Zala. God, I can't ever remember his name. It's been a very long time since I've been in the original CG. But, um, yeah, so there was a, a lower, an ascended troll that was turned into a lower, and he was the one who originally made the uh, fetishes that the Blood Elves then took and turned into Librams and fought the trolls against, like, with their own magic. But that's that's him. And um, he he had a priest there that I, I beat up. I beat up a priest of um, Kragwa and Paku. I think I already said um, there was priests priests and priestesses running away that were from Shavala, like they were horrified it was mm-hmm. happening. Um, there was quite a bunch of like uh, Seth Sethral, sorry, was another one that was running away. But yeah, it it seemed to be um, the the ones that seemed to be the the primary are uh, Gonk, Paku, the prelates, um, that were doing it. Well, I guess the question I should have probably ask is then, who doesn't run away? Is there any is there any like exceptions to this rule? Because I'm assuming, actually, yeah, I'm assuming Shadra wouldn't. 
have run away, but I'm going to be actively wrong. Um, the ones that were scared and not actually revolting, um, there was quite a few. There was like Shavala, um, Tokali, the Tokali drummers. They didn't um, partake in the revolt, but they were there. They were just like sort of like blocked off. Um, they weren't fighting anyone. They were just defending um, other priests that were scared. Um, there was Kragwa priests that weren't fighting. Uh, Johnny's little follow-up was scared. Um, yeah, there, there's quite a few. I, I just remember thinking, oh, like, look at all these lowers that I've, like, Bethic from old ZG, the Panther boss. Um, she had a follower in the house that wasn't fighting either. In fact, they were just sort of there. Um, yeah, so, but it, like I said before, it was mostly the prelates, Paku and... Um, Gonk for mm. yeah for the most for the most part but yes I, I digress um so it, it makes me wonder what this pact like we, we see the pact in the the raid um we see what it can do we see like what one somebody is capable of doing to someone and I mean the blood moon is just out the, out the window you can see it in the the, the flight. Um, mm, just thinking. Well, I mean, we got the cinematic or whatever. Um, so she is bound to Bonsambi through blood now, but it makes me wonder if um the kingdom itself somehow relates to that pact as well. Well, yes, it does because Rust Khan first gives up his kingdom and then Bonsam goes, ha, I don't know, you just guys are going to go back to your life lower. Hmm. Okay. That's some interesting stuff. Because I'll admit with Rust Khan, I couldn't find much in regards to stuff, but there was something I noticed when looking so into him. Oh, sorry, yep. No, no, you go. But yeah, but what I found when I was looking into him, well, just like a weird thing I just noticed was that, um, the Devil Swords, right? Uh, uh Lore of Kings in general, so Rizan and all that. Technically, the Zandalari didn't worship the Devil Swords until a lot later in the timeline of the Trolls in general. As in, we know Dazar was Raptors, like specifically Raptors. The first time the Devil Swords ever seemed to turn up in regards to the Zandalari, just the lore in general, was when they invaded um, Pandaria. And that was after the Zanchuli Council got wiped out of the Thunder King and the Zanchuli Council of 16,000 BC before the Dark Portal. The Zanchuli Council got wiped out. Yeah, that's the only interesting thing I noticed about um, Rastakhan. It was a coincidence I noticed about him when researching this. Oh, it's funny you should mention Pandaria. In uh, Shadows of the Horde, uh, it specifically mentions that there was a darkness at the foot of Zuldazar. And that was at, at, at the mountain of Zuldazar. Oh, it's just that I, I thought, because uh, I was rereading it the other day, because I'm doing some research into one of our videos. Um, Hopefully it'll be out soon. But um, anyway, it, uh, I was listening to the the audio book kind of again. Just, you might kind of just cut out there. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. So yeah, anyway, um, Vulgin, uh Shadows of the Horde. Uh, he's. It tells you that there was a darkness at the foot of Zuldasar. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I thought. Because I was rereading the book, um, when I when I saw that, I thought to myself of Zabala, the big devil saw that's basically at the foot oh. of Zuldazar. And when you read her tablet and you read about her, she's like some form of like diseased, night stalking devil saw. Mm. That if you look at her uh, or you're out caught out late at night, you could get eaten, and you know that's a bad thing. So that that's what I thought of, like. 
and I mean, we know that Zabala is the mother of Razan, and we know that the Titans were doing a whole bunch of like uh, research into lore and stuff like that. So it's always, I've always wondered, knowing what I know about Zabala and Razan, that maybe that, you know, Razan was like meddled with by the Titans. And then he became a lower of kings for the Zandalari. Yeah, true. But when do you think that would have occurred in regards to Razan being met with? Do you assume that would have been when Aldea was still kind of up and running, or would you assume it happened around the time the Zandalari actually started to use Devil Swords? Um, I don't think the Zandalaris were able to use Devil Swords without the favor of Razan. I think that was out of their, their reach. Hmm. Because I had a different take on the idea, and where it's kind of something similar, it's also kind of something different. Because I think, yeah, the Devil Swords were meddled with, but I think it was Zabala specifically that got meddled with in comparison. Because I always figured that the well, yeah, I always figured that at the base of the darkness, at the base of um, Zandalar, that would ended up being Oldia. But thanks to the cataclysm, things kind of just moved together a lot more. But could be wrong with that. But anyway, the idea with Zambala is that um, I figured just reading from what she um, was like, like how she was basically a diseased creature, it made me wonder if she was actually diseased and sorry to go back to Hakai everyone but it just made me wonder if well I think you were the one who told me this idea tell me if I'm wrong but you think in general that Zul is a lot older than is implied in regards to what's kind of known as in you've got um well the Zul we know of but then you've got what was the guy's name? Zulafra. Yes, I do yeah. believe that uh, Zul has either been reincarnated, like he like dies or has his life extended whenever he's about to die, and that he's the original Zulafra, and um, that he didn't actually perish uh, in all dumb with everyone, if with everything else. Or if he did, he reincarnated. Because admittedly, um, yes. I think it's, which totem is it? It's one of the archaeology totems. I think it's the Sanguine totem. kind of gives this really weird impression that if you've been exposed to blood magic for a very long time, you can do some really weird shit. One of them, obviously, the impression I got was that you could, well, yeah, either pass on your life or live a lot longer than expected. But, um, anyway, there kind of, kind of relates to the idea of, um, Nope, what's that one? Never mind. Basically, what I'm kind of getting at with this idea is if Zul was this old, right, has to have been a reason as to why he um wanted Razan as the main lower of the Zandalari. As in, just for me, it doesn't make sense. That um, you have this figure that's been there for all this time, and for whatever reason, he um, brought in or helped bring in Razan's lower. And the reason why I say that as well is because it's one of Razan's ancestors, or supposed ancestors, that helps or kind of instigates the invasion of Pandaria to begin with. And for well, I can, and that's when the Devil Souls start turning up. It's the impression I got was that he, in whatever way, shape, or form, poisoned Zabala, who was at the time the OG um, Devil Saw, and somehow experimented on Razan. And the culmination was that, well, by the end of it all, you had Zandalari, who now had the Lore of Kings, Razan. But as we kind of see with Rastakhan, it didn't actually work out that well because it kind of became heavily isolationist and kind of lost contact with everywhere. And then all the bad stuff started to happen, like 
it's all G, it's all A, it's all D, it's all F, you know, just all the Zoles and what happened there. It just just makes me wonder if um the plan, I guess, on Zol's part, if he is this much of a mastermind, was to um introduce a lower that he could eventually get rid of, but that would also weaken Zen Larry. Because we know Zol, well no, literally see Zol kill his arm, and he seems to know precisely how to do it. And even and taunts he kinda of throws out, it's like why are you so arrogant in front of this thing? I mean, I know you know how to kill lowers, but at the same time, it's very interesting that you're this this smug in front of the Lord of Kings in its in his own home. And the fact that you knew how to use the Tile Desire to begin with to do such a thing just makes me wonder if you'd done something similar before. Hmm. I guess the main 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 theory here is that Zavala was somehow poisoned, possibly with the blood of the car, possibly with just something completely else. And Zul, for whatever reason, or not for whatever reason, but Zul, to whatever means, put Razan in a position to become the Lord of Kings for um Zandalari, with the express purpose of the lethargy that would eventually come on for Khan's reign, as in the idea that he just needed to wait long enough to find a king that would be easy enough to manipulate. I, I could see that happening. But yeah, that, that was a, another tangent. But yeah, you got anything else you want to talk about um, in regards to Ruska, or do you want to be able to make a talk? Um, the, the one thing that I just wanted to mention with Rastakhan and um, Wansundi is that um, in his throne room, it's a huge throne room. It has like the big pictures of um, like the Razan heads and stuff like that and, and all that sort of stuff in it. But it's got water on his throne. Huh. And not only that, that the throne itself looks like um, the the throne of the Titan Keepers in Old Hmm. I'm just trying to think if any of the Titan facilities had thrones that relate to water specifically. So you're right about the design, and you'd assume that there may have been a Titan facility there considering the seal was there to begin with. Oh, it's just like the big peacock feathers. Like It just reminds me of the, the Titan Keepers in the Halls of Origination throne, like the big grand thing there. But um, the throne just near it down the bottom has lotuses and um, water, which you also see in the Lost City of the Tolbeer. So it's just something that I just thought was pretty neat. That's all. Oh, well, now that you mention it, um, one theory I have had that's kind of substantiated is that um, for somehow, to whatever means, Aldea, T.O.T., and... Zandala were connected at some point, and specifically the um, massive towers in Baldoon, like the massive road with the towers on them that seem to conduct electricity, reminds me of TOT. But then coming back to like um, Aldea, like what we know as the whole originations, we've also got the um, entrance itself, which also seemed to have led somewhere once upon a time. And they also all share like similar like resemblances. Like um, in Old Deer, there are these pots that have cobras on them, except there's no cobra to even remotely name in Old Deer of any importance. However, when you skip over to Baldoon, you've got Sethralis, which admittedly has the horn, but it's just interesting similarity in regards to the iconography. But yeah, do you want to move on to make a talk? Sure. So, what you find interesting about me? It's a really fun fight. I agree. However, I pug a lot, and it is hell to pug. I mean, it, you're right, it is a fun fight. As a coordinated raid group, it's just, it... How do I put it? It actually uses communication as a mechanic, and it just works really, really well. But, in regards to pugs, oh boy. Oh boy. 
Um, but yeah, so it's again, this is a fairly straightforward fight. Um, that, uh, oh, sorry, j another thing I just remembered just quickly, um, before I get too into Mecca talk, this is again about Bon Zombie and uh, Rustican. At the very start um, of the fight, before you go in there, uh, Gay again, Greymane uh, asks Rustican to surrender his empire and hand over his daughter as a hostage, which I thought was very strange. Like, I mean, yes, like that sort of stuff did happen uh, in feudal times and whatnot, but again, like the alliance is now after Talanji and they had her already imprisoned in Stormwind before, like what? Is that the Horde side of um, storytelling with that? Because I know with the Alliance side, it's more like, uh, what? he seems more remorseful, and I can't remember him asking for Talanji as a ransom. Um, I mean, it might be, but I thought it was for both, because, I mean, again, like, uh, says that, and then, like, Russell Khan's are like, hey, how dare you say that to me, you exile, you don't have a uh, I'm not going to listen to you. You're in exile. You don't have a home. You don't have like a kingdom. Like you're nothing. How dare you come into my kingdom and demand from me? Get lost. And then again, it's like attack. Let's kill him. And then that all sort of went down. But anyway, back to Mecca talk. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's just something that I had in my head, and I thought, ah, oh, I should probably say it now, or forever hold my peace. Um, but yes, uh, Mecca talk is a very straightforward fight. I mean. He's protecting the fleeing alliance group because um, they've just been in to kill Rasta Khan and now are, are trying to like leave and the horde is right on their tail trying to get out and Mechator jumps in to, to protect, be the rear guard and protect them all and he gets taken down. Can you think of anything in regards to the... Um that between him and Gallowix, I guess, and the introductions of the mechs in general. Oh, man, I love that quest line so much. <laughs> I liked being in the mechs going pew, 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 pew. Oh, that was like, I am a huge Robotech fan, Macross uh, Saga, uh, Tekaman Blade, uh, Gundam, uh, Full Metal Panic. Like, I, I love all of those sorts of uh, shows. Like, I'm very, very much into that sort of stuff. So when I was allowed to fly around in this thing, I was just so excited. I mean, I got that excited when, you know, you could have a Lightforge Warframe as, like, uh, a, a mount. And then, like, oh, yeah, you can have G mod. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is so cool. Um, have you got the mount yet? No, I haven't got G mod yet. But I will eventually. One day. One day, very much so. Um, but, yeah. I mean, it's very much the, the same sort of like rivalry between goblins and gnomes that have been going on in the engineering quarter, well, since forever, really. It's not, mm. yeah, I mean, they shit talk each other. I, I must admit, though, uh, Mecha talk, shit talks uh, Gallywix a lot more than Gallywix does it to him. Uh, which I found hilarious. Uh, I, I don't particularly like Kelly Weeks, so I'm quite happy as a whole person to see him get uh, brought down a peg or two. I, I was very upset, though, that Megatalk was a boss. I mean, I, I, I'm happy on one hand that they're like bringing gnomes to the fore, but uh, Megatalk is one of my, fav my favourite uh, alliance leaders. Uh, I don't really have a lot of alliance leaders that I like, but I do like Mecha Talk. Um, so having him frozen and not being sure whether or not he can get out is very sad. I mean, it also reminds me of Magni. Magni got frozen in Titan technology and then he came back as a crystal. So. Well, uh, that's going to be interesting there now because I can definitely see um, Mecha Talk coming back as a uh, Mecha Man. Or something akin to that. Yeah, I, I could see him coming back as a mecha mecha gnome, uh, maybe in like the mecha gone sort of thing. Um, maybe Mimarin will be able to like maybe there'll be a quest line involving Mimarin 
and Mumran will be able to get him out of the the encasing. Well, Amelia, I will be stunned if there is no quest that relates to Mimram I'm going to make it on, considering that would have been one of his pet projects, or he should know something about it, assumedly. You, you, you want to know what I would like to see in Mecha, Mechagon? Hmm? I want to see the Blingtron army. I want to see... You know how in engineering, if you have the, the Blingtron and you get those encrypted uh, punch cards, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to see that. I want to see either that war, like, continuing and having a hand in it, either, like, <laughs> shutting down the Blingtron units or, like, helping them overthrow their terrible overlords. Um, but I, that's what I want to see. I want to see that. Um, that would be really cool. Um, How it would be. It would be funny if the Unmechanons were the evil overlords. Well, they'd have to be. Oh, maybe. There could be some, something else. Maybe Mecha Goblins. I'm joking. I'm joking. Horrible sense of humour. So, want to move on to Stormwall Blockade? Yeah. There's, unfortunately, there's not too much to talk about Mecha Talk, unfortunately. Well, then we could go on about, like, um, where the mechs go in general, like, I guess the interesting thing I find in regards to introducing technology into a more fantasy-based setting is, like, how far will that actually go? Because the A-Mod and, like, the, um, Goblin mechs in general, they are extremely powerful machines. Yeah, and you've also got the Azerite war tanks and stuff like that, that we've had, like, a massive technology leap uh mm. this uh expansion the one thing that actually i, I will bring this up uh, uh the venture co is also making mechs they have the the mech sabers um the voltron line set but mm. the scrapyard in Kulteris is very interesting the one where the panther unit unit is um yeah. i wonder how long that has been there because don't really see the the Kulterians as being engineering types. In fact, the one if you go and ask the guard where the engineer person is, they're like, "Oh, she's over there. She's weird." Like that's that's the sort of um, I'm paraphrasing really badly there. They don't just say, "Oh yeah, she's weird." They they basically say that you know she's over in that area. Like you know she's very strange for Kulterian sort of standards. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, go over there. Um, so that makes it even more weird for me seeing that uh gnome scrap area in cool terrace like the scrap yard like it's sitting there doing nothing yeah. really but well, um well that's the interesting thing because i can actually give you an answer to that or kind of an answer because that place assumedly has been there for a very very like very long time because in Drasvar you can find these tablets that basically kind of give you a rundown in very cryptic and very cryptic format of what the um, Drust are and like what they're all about in general. And one of them is called Conflicts, and it basically lists through a bunch of enemies the um, Drust have been through. And like the first one is apparently some beasts that also look like them, so I'm assuming this was some relation to the um, Thorn Speakers and how that kind of got integrated into Kulterian society. But then the one after that was, um, actually it might be the Naga next, but the Naga are mentioned there somewhere. But the one after that is actually um, gnomes. And it specifically mentions the idea that of these like creatures that really resemble gnomes. And it's kind of interesting considering the Drust definitely were Titan creations. And, you know, the Mecha Gnomes definitely Titan creations. So the question is, who started the fight? I mean, I know the Drust are bad, but if that's the case, Gnomes always inhabit the island, or did they come to the island for something? Maybe there's a Titan Vault underneath, and that's, like, where their sort of Keeper-ish things were, and then they sort of just, when the Sundering happened. I mean, I'm just thinking here, so... 
take it all with a grain of salt. Maybe when the sundering happened and the islands blew, like, like drew apart, they came to the surface and then the drafts were like, get off our land. And like they did with the Kulterians. And that, that's what sort of sparked it. Hmm. I mean, admittedly, I think that entire area, like the resort, it reminds me of uh, Winter Spring. It's not Winter Spring, it's the other place I can't remember. But it's just like that part of um, Tears Got Sound, Tears Got Sound. It's very pristine. As in its resort, it's a resort for a reason, but it's almost too pristine, as if it's once again kind of like a winter grasp testing facility. And yeah, there might actually be a vault under the um, area in general. Yeah, I can definitely see that being a thing in Den in general. I mean, it'd be interesting if there was a teleporter pad there, or like a um, what's it, Titan Waygate in some way, shape, or form. No. Yeah. All right. Now we can go to the blockade. <laughs> so, Stormwall blockade. What did you find interesting about it? Uh, the fact that they're summoning a giant, like, sea elemental that looks like a mist elemental from Pandaria. I don't think it's an elemental, to be honest. I think it's familiar. Because it's interesting, right? Because we know, okay, we know Culturians have mages and we know they have um, shamans. You've got Tide Sages. Oh, actually, yeah, thinking about it. But then again, what is it? It's um, Jade Fire Masters. That guy's also a Tide Sage, isn't he? For, like the Horde side. Uh, for the Horde, you, you just have the Kulterian Mage and the Draenei. He's just a mage who talks oh. about Phoenix Fires. And he should have been talking about the ocean and water. But I'm sense. not dirty about that at all. <laughs> Okay, I can't say. Yeah, it was a mistake. The reason why, I guess the reason why I thought it was familiar, right, instead of an elemental, is because the Tide Sages there seem to be more mage like than shaman like, which I know is kind of odd considering, you know, Tide Sages and Front Pike seem to obviously relate to shamanism. But at the same time, you can't see where I'm going with that. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of why I don't see it as a familiar is because they're both channeling it. Um, so familiars uh, from like my own sort of like fantasy based things so are completely wrong. Most familiars are tied to a particular person. I mean, uh, we see it with the elemental James. in. No, uh, I was just about to say like. Um, Goldstein in the Elemental Hall, how his fire elemental hates him because he got stuffed in that the totem. And then he, he not only did Goldstein like um, stuff him into a totem, uh, but he also like kills him and takes his like fire heart for a quest in um, Deep Home. And then that sort of sets up this thing where the elemental tries to get back at the shaman and the, the shaman's like, ah, oh, my fire elemental hates me but we're bonded together. So like, this is going to be a problem. So it's kind of like that, like that. That's what I mean. Like, um, uh, so a familiar is sort of like, or an elemental bond is sort of like that. Um, with this Stormwind blockade, I would, I would say that like, this is an actual, actual elemental because there's two uh, Tide Sages calling it in. Um, I don't think that it's a familiar sort of like, because uh, it's not tied to one person. Um, it's very powerful as well. Uh, I think if that was a familiar for one person, like that person would have to be insanely powerful to be able to control that thing by itself, um, which is why it takes two people. Uh, and then, then there's the other thing that uh, Jaina is considered like one of, if not the most powerful uh, ice slash water mage in the world of Azeroth. And even I think she would have difficulties controlling that huge ass water elementally thing, whatever it is mm. um, that we fight. Okay, yeah, I can see your point. So no, it's definitely an elemental. So then I guess the question is, do you think it's similar to Oculus then? As in, you know, just a whole bunch of kelp got caught up in it, and it's just a basically a water elemental. Um, 
Yeah, I would, I would say that it's made from the water around the dock. So it's being formed uh, when we're on the boats and they're pumping a whole bunch of the water and the magic into it to, to um, uh, boost it, if you will. Um, we know that we have to interrupt the, the tight sages doing this, otherwise like the big elemental thing is gonna like get too powerful and it's gonna kick our asses. Um, when we get back to the dock to fight it, we know that if we don't keep the add elementals that spawn from us collecting the water that drops on the, the floor, um, that it regains too much of its power and kicks our ass. Um, it's sort of ass kiss kicking with this thing. Like it, as soon as it gets like, a, a, even like the slightest bit of power back, it just, you know, annihilates everyone, which is very scary but um I, th I think the the most interesting thing about the entire flight is the sirens that come for the brother so i don't really particularly fight him too often um but he on his boat uh he calls sirens to come or sirens come and seduce someone and try and make them jump off the boat. I find it very interesting that it's the dude fella that this happens with and not the chick. The chick doesn't call them at all. She calls lightning and, 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 and that sort of stuff, but he actually summons the sirens in and these sirens look like Naga. And if they're not Naga, then they're a native sort of species to Azeroth potentially the ones that we see in those windows in old Jua, yeah which would be very strange and which would tie them to the water elemental plane so they would be under the control of neptulon which then would make me wonder why neptulon is siding with the tide sages if that's where they get their power from but then they call it the tide mother and they hear her voice and Neptulon's a dude. So there's more questions than answers there. Oh, yeah, because that's, that's the interesting thing that about, well, Tide Sage in general. I said, okay, you wish for Tide Mother. Cool. That makes perfect sense. But where does Neptulon fit into it? As you said, you know, Lord of the Water, Lord of the Abyssal Law. I mean, did something else arise while he was away? Did Tide put something else in? Just curious. And thinking about this as just an elemental, I guess the other thing I would ask is if Neptune is pure water, right? Do you think this elemental, like the um, one, the one we fight, do you think it's just purely water, or do you think there's something else there? Because I, I'd assume that there's more than just water there. So I'd say it's probably storm and water in general. Well, yeah, I think that that's the reason why there's lightning there um is because the, they're adding lightning to it so it forms a, an entity because you know uh i'm getting like vibes of frankenstein's monster here with the lightning comes out pew, pew, and then like the rise my monster um but i think that that's why that there's the um uh, the lightning there so without the the spark of of lightning the thing was never going to to rise from its watery grave and uh beat us up but yeah, so I guess I would agree with you in in that regard. Well, I just find that interesting because looking at my notes here, I did thinking about there is that other reference that's kind of making it's the reference to Golden Earth because you know first thing we see in regards to the um, Argus fight is you know um, storm and sea cleanse etc cetera, etc cetera, and. This magic assumedly would be very similar to that, or you'd assume it'd be very similar. Would you agree with that, or possibly completely different? Mm, agree in part, I would say. Hmm. But you also mentioned um, mist elementals in Pandaria. Why do you think they are similar to that in general? Or why do you think they're similar? I just because of the look of it. I mean, it's a disheveled looking elemental with kelp with one eyeball, or at least I've seen it only with one eyeball, but I, I don't really look at it very close up because I don't have to hit the thing. Um, 
so yeah I don't, I don't know like it just reminds me of like the shambling kind of mist um mist monster and i mean you get sea mist um so yeah it, uh, it's just something that i it's probably just all in my head uh the mist monster thing but yeah no no because this is kind of well part of where the question kind of leads right so you'd agree that this elemental is storm and water okay cool and you also mentioned the idea that this connects to mist now the question i ask is do you think mists in general are an elemental magic and if so what combination would you say they are basically what i'm asking is the idea um what do you think mist magic is made up of? Do you think it's elemental magic and kind of like a fusion of, I don't know, to say like um, water and wind or something else? Or do you think it's just a magic onto itself? Uh, I think it's a combination of magics like air, wind, like air and water. Uh, it, it, I, I feel like it'd have to be. It's the same sort of thing as like storms, storm elementals and stuff would be air and water. And like lava elementals would be like earth and fire. So it's a combination of the magics that combine to make this thing. Hmm. Well, that's the thing, right? Because we've got storm magic, which assumedly relates to, you know, water and air, if not just air alone. But then we've got mist magic, which relates to, once again, water and air. And it just makes me wonder about the, um, well, mists of Pandaria, like literally the place was shrouded in mists, and we know the very, very, very specific reason for that was because of um, Xiao Hao and his pride and all that stuff. So it's just making me wonder if there's some type of well, connection there to some, I guess, shadowy power, I guess. Because in the idea that mists are, well, I guess the darker equivalent of what you'd say a steam elemental is, which is, you know, fire and water, heat, etc, etc, but you kind of flip this over and you get um, mist, which is kind of um, water and air, which is kind of cold, and this relation to hot and cold also kind of relates to that thing I mentioned with the Jade Fire Masters, and the idea that Phoenix represents the quote-unquote heat of the universe, while the frost and all that relates to the cold of the universe in general. I guess the in turn assumption here would be that this heat is somehow related to the light and this cold is somehow related to the void or like shadow magic in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. It's a long convoluted line of logic, I know. But um just yeah, just just a thought that crossed my mind. So that just leaves Jaina then, yeah? Yeah, and um are you gonna be okay talking about Jaina? Ah, uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, it's no secret I don't like Jaina. I've not liked Jaina since Warcraft 3. And I would be doing everyone a disservice if I didn't ask why. Ah, uh, her choices have been pathetic at best. That That's pretty much, like, how I'm going to sum it up. Like, she's always chosen the wrong uh, way to go about things, or at least that's how I feel. I'll probably get hate mail over this, but uh, yes. Fighting um, words. So, so what what choices do you think were just, I guess, pathetic, or you know, what, what choices do you just disagree with that she's chosen in general? What choices to take? Mass teleporting out and like leaving the horde to kill her dad because she couldn't be bothered to like <laughs> sort it out herself at Theramor. Um <laughs> uh not actually standing up to Arthas and like again leaving uh I also blame Uther for that as well at uh Stratholm. They could have done what they did to the orcs. They they could have done what they did to the orcs and like quarantine it, but no. Let's True. just not stop Arthas from purging his own people and then let's forget regret it later and be all sad and sob story and people have to be sad for me because i like i chose wrong but you know i feel really good that i was able to walk away from like the biggest thing that i should have been able to prevent anyway like i said this is really bad um 
Uh, I'm sure everyone's going to hate me now because I don't like Jano. But um, it is what it is. It's not a bad opinion to have. I mean, it's an interesting opinion to have, to be perfectly honest. I mean, personally, Jano, I don't have a problem with Jano. She's an interesting character. However, something that I think you pointed out to me and something I've just held on to because I played through um, Pandaria, Domination Point questline, is she's technically a war criminal. She is! Oh my goodness, I was about to say, I can't believe I forgot about her purge of Dalaran with the pew pews of the unnamed, unarmed civilians. And then having people tell me, oh, but you know, she didn't want to kill them, but they did betray her. Oh, pish posh. She didn't have to shoot them down with ice. Um, yeah. So for those who don't or didn't play during Pandaria, basically during the Domination quest line, yeah, I think it was April, Jeez. It was like point two or point one. Basically you um you have the whole Divine Bell quest line and during this quest line turns out that the or oh, well like one of the Sun Reavers uses Dalaran to help the horde. Jane Apis. It was Ape was it Apis specific? Yes. I thought I thought it was Rommel. Yes. No, it's Apis. Oh shit, that makes it even worse. So I thought, okay, well, Aethys helps um, Garrosh get the Divine Bell and uses Zalaran to do so. Jaina found find that, and she's still roiling from um, Theramore, and it's no excuse. I have to say right now, I don't think it's an excuse at all, but what she basically does is she goes walking through Dalaran, just one-shotting as many elves as she can possibly find, as in she is not happy whatsoever. And... It's just one of those things where it's like, okay, Garrosh is crazy. Sylvanas has definitely committed war crimes, whether they're justified or not. Story for another day. But when you look at Jaina's track record, it's like, she's not a saint in the slightest. And she's, in some aspects, just as bad as the, um, just as bad as um, Sylvanas and Garrosh in some regards aspects i mean in her case she literally did everything she did out of anger the the other thing is that she views it as like a betrayal of herself and the alliance and she's supposed to be the leader of the kirin tor at that particular time and the kirin tor are neutral and one of the things that i thought that the reason why sort of atheist does get on board with garrosh is that he felt that dalaran under i mean i could be completely wrong um, and just sort of like saying this to justify my own position on Jaina. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, it could be like I have a very clouded view um, with it because I don't like Jaina. Um, that he, I, I thought that they, they did it not only because uh, Garrosh wanted them to, but because they felt that the Kieran Tor were leaning more towards um and, and Dalaran was more alliance-leaning than neutral, and that's sort of also why they did it. Um, I don't think it was Romoth. Romoth hates or has not liked Dalaran and the Kirin Tor for the longest time. Um, he, When Aethys first originally p appears and tries to get them to go to um, the north than land, like the, the north lands or the northern lands, um, to go and fight the Lich King, Romath was very against him even being in the area and talking to Aethys and like going and helping Dalaran with the the, the war against like the Nexus War, et cetera, et cetera. Like Romath didn't want that to happen at all. Um, so I, I really don't think it was Romath. I'm almost certain it was Aethys who did it. And I mean, you've got to kind of sit there and wonder if it is Aethys, like why he would go against a Kirin Tor that he so absolutely loves, like, under Jaina. Because, yeah, that's the thing that's kind of, like, going through my mind, because I know Aethys plays a part in the uh, Mage War, not war campaign, Legion, during the War Class Order Halls, Aethys turns up again, and he is, once again, the ever-so-loving Kirin Tor neutral person. And I think during the time, like during the Domination Point quest line, 
there was that one conversation, it's like the final confrontation between, I think, Lothamai and Jaina, just in front of TOT. There is this indication that, I think it was Aethys at the time, knew something that, or knew more about the Divine Bell than he was ever letting on. But I thought the person that actually helps you in the quest, like, infiltrate Darnassus, was Roman. And then, like, the whole Aethys thing following that was just that kind of inkling. It's like, maybe you knew what Romoth was doing, but you just didn't stop him, because, you know, Romoth is always angry. Has he, is he ever happy? Um, oh, I would imagine, but I know Romoth doesn't particularly like Aethys. Like, those two have a history. Hmm. But, yeah, um, so there, there is that. I mean, then there's the whole... Jaina letting us down in Legion, where cat cat guys are like, "Come and help us, Jaina." She's like, ah, horde, and then just teleports out, and we don't see her for an entire expansion. Like, uh, okay, I mean, that was pretty disappointing. I, I won't lie. I mean, like, I understand being angry. I've seen him being like really, really angry. But um, if you're willing to say, you know what, screw the world. I'm still going. I'm going to stay. Remain angry. Just because uh. I mean, okay, Marion did just die. So I uh, and you know, the alliance still thinks it was Sylvanas' fault in that regard, even though it was a justified tactical retreat. But once again, another topic for another day. But yeah, so I get once again why she's angry. But the fact she was willing to abandon her, basically her nephew. Her, her allies, her friends, it's like, well, I mean, I guess how I put it, when she came back in before the storm and she says the idea of, like, if you really don't want anger to take over your life, I guess she has had some type of epiphany. Not sure what it was, though. I can't get behind it. Even when I was in Thros, um with her, I was like, can we just leave her here? I don't want to go and <laughs> Oh, jeez. I, I just couldn't. <laughs> I know this sounds horrible. I'm just like, I'm probably doing the world a favor by just leaving her here. And it's just like the quest comes up. It's just like, hey, you want to go and like save Jaina from Thoros? It's like really bad down there. It's like, eh, not really. Oh, jeez. All the way through the quest line, it's like, oh, she's not here. I'm like, oh, hooray, she's not here. You generally were just hoping you wouldn't find her, right? <laughs> Correct. And then when Catherine says to me, it's like, oh, she liked playing hide and seek. I'm like, why is that not surprising? <laughs> but yeah, I guess something about Jaina that I'm going to be interested in regards to the future is how Blood Elves will react to her. Because of all the things I can think of that's going to have her character be in contention with the Horde in the future. It's going to be what she did in Valorant during DOT. So that was one of the few, at least in my opinion, one of the few instances where her character just fell over. And not in a bad way, but she's like just tri- acted in acted in a quote unquote evil manner, basically. What do you mean not in a bad way? She's shooting people down left, right, and center with ice bolts. Although I have went through and played the Alliance side of that. And on the Alliance, this is very tricky, Blizzard. On the Alliance side, she doesn't shoot down anyone that's unarmed. She actually, like, teleports them away. So the Alliance thinks that she's great. But on the Horde side, she's just throwing those eyes, bolts left, right, and center. It doesn't matter if you're whatever. She's like, a, you're a blood elf and you're running away. Pew, pew. You're gone. Like, she's a gunslinger at that point walking down the, the, the road. Like, I did not know that. That is, that is tricky. <laughs> terrible. I guess because it's been doing that type of stuff for quite some time. Yeah, and it's that sort of thing that can skew you. Like, if you don't play both sides and you don't see it, like, I have had this argument with people uh, well, ever since I've made my sort of stance on Jaina known. Uh, they'll say, oh, you know, she was conflicted and troubled, like with the office thing, and I'll say, well, no, she was dumb, and she didn't consider all options. And Just because she's dumb doesn't mean she isn't conflicted. And I'm not saying Jaina's dumb. I'm just... 
She, <laughs> please keep going, Mom. Yeah, I'm, I make these sorts of like when it comes to Jaina, I make people either love me or hate me, mostly hate me. Um, but like with every single uh, choice that she's made, she's like, to me at the very least, she's chose wrong. Um, and if I was in that situation, people are like, if you're in that situation, you would have done the same thing. It's like, well, no, I wouldn't have. I would have considered all my options before actually, like, you know, acting on it because I'm not irrational in those sorts of uh, situations. I guess the question is, can you understand why someone would be irrational in those situations? No, actually, I can't. I, in those sorts of situations, like for me, this is going to make me sound absolutely horrible, but it's in those situations where I feel that you should consider all options and, and weigh it up far more than what she's, she's done. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing though, I, I will just get off my, my Jaina hatred train at the, the, the present. I mean, we could sit here and talk about this all night and I'd still like walk out of there still not liking Jaina. Um, but what I did notice is um, when she teleports uh, out into the middle of the ocean to freeze it, I don't know if you noticed this too, much, but she goes into a ball that looks very similar to the focusing iris. It's got the arcane runes and, and all that stuff when she teleports, it's a big ball. And I thought that was very interesting given that she got hit with some of the arcane focusing Iris's power, that that would appear again. And, um, yeah. Well, I mean, could that be possibly part of the reason why she's so powerful at the moment? I mean, okay, she's always been extremely talented, but at present she seems kind of OP to the nth degree, as in not even Khadgar's as broke as to bring a flying ship in to the Battle of Lordaeron, use its cannons to blow down the wall, and on top of all of that, use a massive frost spell to just dispel the blight. Yeah, she should have just really let it go. <laughs> I'm dying here. <laughs> she couldn't hold it back anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I do. I do believe that that is where a lot of her power um, amplified, like the amplified power that she's wielding at the moment, is coming from. Um, it's why her hair is white. Um, it's why when she uh, pulls out the arcane spell when Bane brings Derek spoilers uh, back to her. <laughs> um, that you see the arcane flare in her eyes, like that's all I, I would imagine from the fo like leftover residue from uh, the focusing iris. Um, I don't think she'll fully ever get rid of this. Also, just going back to my Jaina hate trade for a little bit. Um, yep. I'm gonna jump all over the place on this particular boss. Um, do you know that her mentor? Um, What's his face? Um, Antonidas. Yep. Didn't actually want to take her on as an apprentice. She had to badger and nag him to take her on as an apprentice because, one, he didn't want her because she was a girl, but, two, she, he also didn't think that, you know, she was cut out for that sort of stuff. Yes, but was that because she was a girl? I'd say a little bit of it was, yeah, but... Uh, like, I mean, I just don't like Jaina, so a small part of me just wanted to, like, see her fail. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, I mean, you're not on the train that Jaina's a dreadlord. You're just on the, on the train that she's a horrible person. Yeah, pretty much. I guess that works. I mean, I am curious in regards to the Daughter of the Sea scenario as in what she actually did to raise that ship, or what helped her, or if anything did possibly Hydromancy. So she's part shaman then? Or no. Um, for the longest time, uh, it's the reason why she can use the amulet, amulet to bring back the fleet. It's the reason why her dad could do it too. 
uh, hydromancy runs in the Proudmoore family. It's kind of why they rule Pool Terrace. Um, and it's also the reason why she's like the most talented uh, frost mage uh, around because she she has the arcane mage affinity. Uh, on top of that, she's a hydromancer, so she's got an affinity for water. So it's no surprise that she is a frost mage. Like that's just straight up and and whatnot. So raising the ship is uh, some parts hydromancy, some parts uh being like a mage and being able to do it um in warcraft 3 there was these things called revenants and they were like sea elementals but they were also undead oh yeah they were undead they were considered undead so um and i wouldn't be surprised if a re if like the revenants um fell under hydromancy as well so that that's a little bit of trivia um that's interesting, Trivia. Do these revenants have any forms of personality as the idea of what no. undead? So they no. Just no. Of... They look very similar to the ice revenants and the the elementals that we see in Northrend. Ah, uh, and okay. I mean, those revenants specifically relate to old gods, if not mistaken. So they're the um, augmented ones or the ones that fall under the arm. Uh, yeah, they have the armor and the shield and they sort of mm. like topple around the little legs. Yeah, that, that's what the revenants were in uh, Warcraft 3. Uh, and I, 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 like I said, like I believe that the reason why Tandred and Catherine and Derek possibly wouldn't have been able to be, um, unless Derek, because Jaina says, oh, you know, I thought Derek was going to be the Lord Admiral after Dad. Um, I would say that the amulet would choose whoever has the 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 best hydromancy powers to and the 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 pendant sort of like augments those powers in order to control the Kulteran fleet. Hmm. Would you say hydromancy is the same magic that the Tides Age usually use or something different? No. Or otherwise any Tide Sage would have been able to wield the the pendant. And being Lord Admiral, so no, I think it's a, a special sort of like magic that the Proud Moors have. Hmm. Thinking about me, this goes back to the Storm of Arcade. It makes me wonder about the well, sea and storm magic versus the magic of the mists, and if hydromancy possibly just relates to one of those specifically. I mean, in the case of this, the idea would be uh, hydromancy relates to the mists and. So much of form tide sage magic relates to the storm and sea, and then you know, Jane just happens to be an arc uh, mage on top of that, so but yeah, that is an interesting, interesting distinction there. So, yeah, like, so when she parts the mist and go, Oh, there you are, like, it just is so easy for her to locate them. Um, whereas you know, Catherine had been trying for ages to bring the fleet home and couldn't. And if Tandred was a hydromancer, he would have just been able to talk to the ocean and um, been able to go home. And no Tide Sage would have been able to, like, sort of hide his home from him. True. True. But it is interesting that, that you brought up the idea that there are two distinct types of magic that kind of come from Colter Us. One is the hydromancer that seems to be specifically related to the Proud Moors, and the Tide Sage magic, which is, yeah. Lord Stormsong and all that. And actually thinking about it though, we can see the stories of Lord Stormsong and all that kind of interactions. It makes you wonder where the uh, Proud Moors kind of fit into that story. Because considering how prominent Lord Stormsong was, like the original Lord Stormsong was, it makes you wonder why he or his family wasn't ruling Colterast by the end of the day. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've often wondered why that wasn't the case. But, with all this said, we've kind of been going on for quite a while now, so I guess, do you have any final words that relate to Jaina or anything else you really wanted to mention about Jaina? Um, I'm incredibly, dis <laughs> no, I'm incredibly disappointed we didn't get to kill her and that she gets... Uh... 
you have to at least see it coming in some way, shape, or form. I mean, Kanga did it all the time, and I have to say, trying to kill a mage is kind of difficult, considering they can just, you know, teleport out the last second, or ice block and teleport. I wonder if it'll make that an ability. Yeah. I am kind of hoping that Rexar, like, gets her, like he wants to, like he wants to, because, like, she's broken the Theramore cord. Go, Rexar. The horde lives in you. And you know what? We'll save the conversation in regards to Thrall another day, because that's another interesting one. Right, Locke? It absolutely is. All right. So um, thank you for listening, and uh, hope you have a nice day.